The Mark Moore's project is concerned with paper types and calligraphies in the Condor Redondo collection in the Bibliotheca Nationale, the core of which dates from the late 18th and early 19th centuries. In this presentation, I will be discussing my experience of working on paper in music manuscripts from the 17th and early 18th centuries. For music manuscripts of this earlier date, the purpose and objectives of paper research differ somewhat from those of the Markhamus project. However, the basic principles and techniques of study remain the same. In particular, I hope to show that research on watermarks, while only of limited use for dating manuscripts of this period, is an important tool for understanding their codicology, that is, their their physical properties as books. In what follows, I will assume some basic understanding of terminology for describing handmade paper. For example, I will refer to watermarks and their countermarks. If you have any questions about this presentation, please feel free to get in touch with me. My email is, is shown on screen. By far the most significant model for my work has been that of the English musicologist Robert Thompson, whose 1988 thesis on English music manuscripts and the fine paper trade, 1648 to 1688, explores for the first time the potential of paper research for musicologists working on sources before 1700. Thompson's starting point was the monumental catalogues of watermark designs from the first half of the 20th century, such as Edward Hewood's watermarks, mainly of the 17th and 18th centuries, published in 1950. The limitations of these catalogues were very apparent to Thompson from the outset of his work. The monumental catalogues draw on a wide range of types of documents, and their reproductions do not always give a clear indication of the source of a watermark or its size crucial factors when attempting to identify similar watermarks. Today, such catalogues are mainly useful as a guide to watermark designs, and their influence today is felt in the terminology used to describe watermark figures, which are found together with official translations in other languages, uh, in English and in other languages, in the International Standard for the Registration of Papers, published online by the International Association of Paper Historians. Thompson was also aware of the limited applicability of paper research done by musicologists in earlier decades of the 20th century on the autograph collections of major 18th century composers, such as Alfred Dürer's work on J.S. Bach's cantatas and Alan Tyson's on Mozart. The main aim of such studies was to establish a basis for a reliable chronology of works. This could be accomplished because Dürer and Tyson were in effect studying paper used by a single musician, single individual, documenting when and where these composers used a certain type of paper. Similar techniques have been since used by other scholars to date the autograph manuscripts of other 18th century composers that survive in significant quantity, including Paul Everett's work on Vivaldi and Dono, Donald Burroughs and Martha J. Ronish's on Handels. However, few collections of such size survive for pre-1700 composers. The one exception is perhaps Marc-Antoine Charpentier. The source situation for most 17th century and early, early music is much more fragmentary and sources that relate to one another in terms of, their, terms of their codicology, for example through a shared paper type, are very few, although one can encounter shared handwritings between manuscripts that otherwise appear not to have any connection. Um, in effect, the technique of dating undated manuscripts on the basis of their codicology, codicological relationship to others that are dated, used to powerful effect by Dewar, Tyson and others, is, is not relevant.
If we admit that the paper record before 1700 is too fragmentary to establish reliable information for dating, we might ask, what is the purpose of paper research? Thompson found that understanding the wider context of the 17th century paper trade, in particular patterns of supply, can provide vital clues to dating. In other words, external information about the marks themselves, such as the geographical region in which the paper was manufactured, the merchant or factor who sold the paper, uh, he's often expressed in initials below the main mark. And even in some cases when the uh, paper maker is identifiable, the paper mill where it was produced. So we can see that in initials in countermarks. Uh, these can be used to provide some idea of dating. Just as significantly, however, research on paper can help the researcher to establish how music manuscripts of this period, many of which were copied before they were bound or were never bound in the 17th century, were put together. The fact that 17th century music manuscripts were sometimes used for extended periods before they were bound, put in bindings, has important implications for how these documents are to be understood. It means, for instance, that the, the present order in which the leaves are to be found may not reflect the order in which they were copied. And it may mean that manuscripts that are today separately bound may have once formed part of larger collections. I'm now going to summarize Thompson's founding, uh, findings for English manuscripts, and then we'll compare them with my findings for Portuguese manuscripts. So Thompson found uh, for 17th century English manuscript, music manuscripts um, some common features. Uh, one is the high quality paper. And the reason why uh, they have high quality paper, uh, the high quality paper in manuscripts uh, with music is because of the uh, quantity of ink that you need to notate music. Um, when you are with lesser quality papers, uh, they typically suffer from bleed through where the ink becomes visible on the other side of the page. So rendering that side of the page useless. And it means you can't notate music on both sides of the page. So higher quality papers meant you could write on both sides of the page. He also found that the, this is related. He also found that there were a small number of watermark types. Uh, and this is a consequence of the high quality type papers used, since uh, these types of papers featured specific watermarks. So these watermarks would help merchants identify them when they, when they were being uh, sold. So, for example, the, uh, the Angoumois fleur de lis that we find in many English music manuscripts was associated with larger format, high quality papers. Uh, and those types of papers were known in the trade as medium or demi. Uh, other marks that we found in English, we find in English music manuscripts include the arms of Amsterdam and the Dutch lion, uh, which are slightly smaller types of paper uh, of a size that was known as fool's cap. Uh, he also found that the supply of paper to England changed in accordance with the political situation. So, for example, after 1690, uh, when England was with war, war with France, um, paper was then uh, imported from, from the Netherlands. Uh, formerly, the same paper makers had been active in the southwest of France in the Angoumois region, and they had but they were also forced to flee uh, France at this time and set up their, their mills, paper mills in the Netherlands. And so, uh, and we can tell which papers uh, belong to which period. So it gives you an approximate idea of, of dating. Uh, and so he's also identified some of the uh, 
the makers of the paper uh, found in countermarks, so CDG is Claude de Georges. Um, you also found that music paper was generally ruled with staves by professional stationers, uh, that's music booksellers, uh, using a rastrum before uh, the paper was so sold to musicians. So a rastrum is a tool that consists of several pens and each pen will have five nibs in order to draw the five lines required of staves for polyphonic music. And normally a rastrum will have up to six pens. Rastrology is the study of the measurements between the staves and their width as drawn by a rastrum. Each rastrum varies slightly from one another in terms of the distance between the pens and the setup of the nibs. Thus, the stave widths and the gaps between them will be unique to each rastrum. Uh, used in conjunction with evidence from watermarks, rastrology helps musicologists to establish where, whether two paper types are the same or the extent to which they are similar. My own findings on, on music paper in Portuguese manuscripts uh, is, is shown on screen. So again, we find generally, not always, but generally high quality paper and in the, in the false cap size, um, which is 32 by 42 centimeters. Often we find uh, the, the sheets have been folded in half. So you'll typically get a page that measures um, 32 by 21 centimeters. Uh, similar paper is found in legal documents in the Tour de Tombeau. I'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, and we find again a small number of watermark types. Um, there's the shield with cross, the arms of Genoa, and the circles. Uh, this, I think this has the potential for dating, although yet uh, as yet, I'm not able to come up with anything definitive. Um, the shield with cross, uh, ten, which is not shown on screen, it tends to be found in earlier paper from about 1650 or earlier. Uh, but I've not found a significant enough examples to suggest when exactly that mark stopped being used in the paper that we find in music manuscripts. Um, the arms of Genoa and the circles, uh, they, they're in use throughout the 17th century and continue to be used well into the 18th. Um, and I think as in England in this period, uh, the small number of watermark types reflects the limited number of suppliers for the high quality paper that you need to, to copy music. Uh, we don't tend to find countermarks. The countermarks are very typical of the, of the Dutch and uh, of the Dutch papers, but not, not in these Italian papers. Um, uh, um, and, but these initials that we find in the marks themselves may correspond to the, uh, the makers or the geographical area of the maker. Um, paper was ruled by musicians themselves using a single five nib pen. So not a rastrum, they didn't use a rastrum. This means that rastrology is of no use for studying music paper in Portugal from this period. Uh, though I will show shortly uh, how measuring the width of the stave lines and their number on a page helps to support evidence provided by watermarks. My research on Portuguese manuscripts has con concentrated on two important collections, one in Braga and the other in Coimbra. I will consider the Coimbra collection first. The Carta Passage are an important group of manuscript scores bound into 16 volumes originating from the Monastery of Santa Cruz de Coimbra. They contain over 1300 folios and their contents span a wide range of genres current in mid 17th century Portugal including villancicos in vernaculars and Latin sacred music, as well as dramatic music, consort music and theoretical texts. Though parts of the collection are lost, it is remarkable for its size and scope. 
in his 2017 PhD thesis on one of the manuscripts, Tiago Simas Freire argued that the manuscripts were copied largely by a single individual who appears to have been a composer, probably the organist and composer Don Gabriel de Saint Juan, who died in 1658. I agree with his assessment and I've tried to support it with evidence from the paper as I'm about to show. The manuscripts, today forming part of the collection of the Biblioteca Geral da Universidad de Coimbra, are listed on screen. Each is an upright volume of similar dimensions and has a binding of parchment taken from a discarded volume of plain chant. The volumes have two systems of numbering shown in the right hand column on the table. One was used by the composer copyist himself, entered onto preliminary leaves before they had obtained their bindings. So we have examples of music manuscripts that were copied before being bound. And another is found on the covers, uh, and this was added when the volumes were bound. Before binding, the manuscripts were organized in bundles that Don Gabriel called cartapacios, as can be seen from the inscri inscription on the preliminary leaf of manuscript 49. Cartapacio 18, vespers a 7 e a 8 con voz de fora. Most of the volumes contain a single bundle like this one, though four contain two bundles. The first bundle of manuscript 239, for example, is named the 10th Cartapacio, while the second, though lacking a preliminary relief, is the 13th. Not all Cartapacios were numbered, and there are also gaps in the numbering. There are no Cartapacios numbered 1 to 2, 5, 8 to 9, 16 or 20. This tells us that some cartapacios are lost, including the unusual manuscript 236 and the unnumbered cartapacio in manuscript 234. The 16 volumes contain 26 bundles or cartapacios in total. The two volumes also reflect use of the collection after Don Gabriel's death, one of them the complex and miscellaneous manuscript 236. Uh, manuscript 236 contains six bundles each between 20 and 92 leaves each. Clues concerning the chronology of the manuscripts and how the composer the copyist went about compiling them come from some dates above individual pieces. Notable are a series of dates in the sixth cartapacio from manuscript 2 to 8 that suggests that Don Gabriel added to this manuscript as and when he needed to and not over a shorter period of time. To judge from these dates, this section of the manuscript was copied between the spring and autumn of 1645 for various purposes, including a commission for the nuns of the Benedictine Monastery in Semid. Does the evidence of the paper support the hypothesis that Don Gabriel compiled these manuscripts gradually as and when new pieces were composed or were obtained from other composers? Yes, an examination of the dates in the manuscripts, the numberings of the manuscripts and the paper types suggests that most of them were copied successively over periods of two or three years. Paper type C, for example, was prepared with 16 staves per page to accommodate wor works with three or four choirs that are found in the third and fourth cartapacios, that is stave ruling type C, and elsewhere with 12 staves per page, that is stave ruling type A2. It was in use between 1643 and 1645. The next stock of paper was used over the, two, the following two year period between 1646 and 1648. Most of the paper was prepared for music copying as soon as it became available. We know this because four of the manuscripts in this group contain the same stave ruling measurement, that is stave ruling measurement A3. A third type of paper of slightly smaller dimensions, paper type B, which would allow the drawing of only 10 instead of 12 staves per page, 
was used for copying the 12th Kartapasu and the unnumbered Kartapasu in manuscript 243 around the same time. A similar picture emerges with the next group of manuscripts copied between 1649 and 1651 using paper type A1 or two variants of it, A2 and A3. These manuscripts likewise mostly feature the same stave ruling, ruling measurement. In this case, stave ruling measurement A1. Thus the paper was prepared for music copying as soon as it became available. The chronology of the manuscripts will suggest that the undated 17th and 18th Carta passages date from the same period as their companions in the same group. In sum, the numbering system and the dates on the manuscripts and the paper types, that is the watermarks and the stave rulings, paint a picture of a musician gradually using up his stock of paper and replenishing it whenever needed. And this is in a, ma in a manner similar to how some composers in the 18th century, what we know about 18th century composers, uh, such as Handel, typically used their stocks of paper. Another feature to note about the table on screen is that many cartopasios feature either 48 or 96 leaves. So I'm wondering whether this reflects how the paper was bundled together in reams by paper merchants before it was actually sold to musicians. The second case study from Braga concerns a single manuscript exceptionally complex from the codicological view. Manuscripts 964 in the Archivo Distrital de Braga has long been recognised as an important source of 17th century organ music. Important publications on the manuscript include Gerhard Dordera's edition of most of the organ music, which was published in the Gulbenkian Foundation series Portugalia, Mus Portugalia, Musica, Portugalia Musica in, in 1974. Other important contributions on the keyboard music have been made since by Bernadette Nelson, Edith Rocha and Sergio Silva. However, a number of questions remain about the volume as a whole, including its date and the related questions of why it was put together and by whom. My investigation suggests that the volume was mostly copied by the organist and composer Pedro Darujo between the 1690s and his death in 1707. I recently discovered his death date. So if you want more details about that, I can supply those. However, as a collection of 243 leaves divisible into 32 groups, uh, which I call fascicles, of many different types of paper, it is a complex document. Altogether, 28 types of paper can be identified though there are four principal types of paper, A, C, K and T. And the remaining paper uh, occurs in relatively small quantity, often as little as a single leaf or bifolio. Two of the main types of paper, A and T, appear to be of 18th century date. Type A is the most voluminous in the manuscript and contains some uh, some was used to copy some miscellaneous dances and airs, uh, some of which uh, post date 1687 um, and certainly uh, and probably date from around uh, the first decade of the 18th century. Um, and paper T is associated with paper A um, and is probably of similar date. Most of the watermarks are typical of the Genoese paper that was that was most of the watermarks are typical of the Genoese paper that was exported to Portugal in the 17th century. So I, so I showed some examples of the watermarks in in this type of paper earlier when I was discuss, discussing some of the general characteristics of paper uh, in Portuguese mu music manuscripts. Exceptionally, however, we find 
two examples of Northern Europe European paper, a post horn and an arms of England. Both are represented in the Braga manuscript in significant quantity. The arms of England mark includes the initials of Abraham Janssen. He was a Dutch merchant active in the Angoumois, a paper making region in the southwest of France, whose mills produced paper for export to England and the Netherlands in the 1670s and 1680s. So he was one of those Dutch paper makers active in France before they were forced to leave. Uh, the arms of England implies that the intended destination for the paper was England. Uh, so its appearance in a Portuguese manuscript is certainly surprising. There is currently very little information available concerning the presence of Angoumois paper in Portugal in the 17th century. On their own, these watermarks and others offer little information for dating paper. Most of the watermark designs belong to common types, which were used over lengthy periods. With a view to establishing their approximate date, however, I consulted a series of documents in the Tour de Tombeau, the records of the Cartorio de, de Lisboa. These records consist of dated chrono chronologically ordered volumes. The volumes contain reliably datable paper that was used in large quantity and quickly. Therefore, the dates on the documents reflect closely the date at which the paper was purchased. It is also similar to the paper found in music manuscripts. Some of the results of this comparison are shown in the table on screen. The first four rows show data for the four variants of paper type A. And in the lower type, lower half of the table are examples of watermarks of the same type, the arms of Genoa, uh, that feature similar lettering, either SPDA or LB, from the records of the Cartorio Notario de Lisboa. And the findings seem to suggest that a date in the first decade of the 18th century is appropriate for the principal paper type, that's paper type A. So it's confirming what we already knew somewhat, but at least it's, it's useful to have that. I'd like to end by drawing your attention to the similarity between one of the watermarks in a Cartorio Notarial document, Cartorio Notarial document dated 1711, and the watermark in paper type U in the Braga manuscript. When superimposed, the two watermarks are almost identical. There is unfortunately not enough of the paper in the music manuscript in Braga to confirm if the watermarks belong to the same paper. We only have one example of the watermark in the music manuscript. As you can see on the right, the superimposition of the two marks shows they are not quite identical. Nevertheless, I think this provides some further confirmation that a significant portion of the Braga manuscript was probably copied in the early 18th century. It was not possible in this presentation to explore these Portuguese case studies in the, in the detail I would have liked though I have tried to give an outline of my findings and to suggest the ways in which the study of paper can assist research on music sources. Thank you for your attention.